from the conclusion of Susanna's presentation, KG's success depends upon contributions from many people. These range all the way from those who actually are part of the case control studies, which provide the data that we ultimately analyze in KG, includes the predictors who actually participate in this experiment and allow us to assess how well they are performing and, allow, and then allow them to learn from it. But one of the most critical, and includes the data set providers who have been extremely generous with, the, with providing data pre-publication, in many cases going through considerable trouble to give us these data, both because they're voluminous and because in many cases they include identifiable patient data, which needs to be released under very controlled ways. But perhaps the most important set of people, as Susanna said, are the assessors, who invested many hours to try to understand how well the different predictors did so we can learn from this experiment and be able to use this information to assess where we stand as a community and how to be able to go further. We were extraordinarily fortunate for our very first KG to have as one of the assessors, Pauline Ng, who has probably more history and experience in this field of genome interpretation than anyone else. And so we were extraordinarily fortunate to have her um, in, engage in this experiment, um, working from the Genome Institute of Singapore, where she moved last year. And it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to her now to tell you about the results um, from the more molecular aspects of the KG study. Pauline. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how the amino acid um, substitution prediction algorithms uh, worked in KG. And a disclosure is that I am the author of the SIFT algorithm, and I was also a submitter as well as an assessor, um, so I submitted SIFT predictions. As Stephen mentioned, um, I am no longer at JCVI or FHCRC where I wrote the algorithm, and so if you are using SIFT or want to compare SIFT, the new algorithm, uh, or it's just being hosted at a new website, sift-dna.org. Okay. So the first data set are mutations in cystothionine beta synthase, or CBS for short. And mutations cause homocystinuria, which is, um, can be seen as mild retardation, um, eye defects, and also this uh, chest abnormality. And for half of the patients, you can... Um, you can treat them by giving them vitamin B6. CBS uses two cofactors, PLP and heme, and I'm telling you all this biology so that when I uh, talk about the results, you'll understand why um, you'll have some background. So PLP is pyridoxine, and the uh, person who generated, Jasper Ryan, who generated the data set, tested CBS mutations in both low and high pyridox pyridoxine conditions. Okay, the structure of CBS is known for about 75% of the protein, um, the, the C terminus of the protein, sorry, the N terminus of the protein. We're actually missing the regulatory regions, residues 415, uh, 414 to 551. This is the raw experimental data that was given to all of the uh, submitters, and they were told to predict the activity. So they were told that there were in mutations introduced into the CBS, uh, CBS protein, and they were assessed by an in vivo yeast complementation assay. There are 52 substitutions assayed, and um, what you can see in this table here is you would have the substituted residue, I286A, for example, an isoleucine substituting to an alanine at position 286, and in high pyridoxine, you'd have a relative growth rate of 55 with a standard deviation of 11. Um, this mouse... I'm, I'm reading the first row, if you can't see my mouse. Um, in, grow, in low pyridoxine, this first substitution of I286A had an activity of only 18% with a standard deviation of 5. So for each substitution, there was uh, activity in both high pyridoxine and low pyridoxine, and we asked submitters to predict on both conditions. There are 23 submissions, and most submitters provided data for both high and low concentrations. So we had five metrics for this particular test. Area under the curve, accuracy, spearman rank correlation, which is non-parametric, z-scores, and root mean square deviation. And I'd like to thank Ido Friedberg, who also uh, was an assessor at, um, for this, uh, for CBS. Okay, so um, I'm not going to show who was the top since this is not a competition, but more a learning experience, I'm um, not showing the top algorithms, but these are the algorithms in top five color-coded. And you can see that 
some algorithms performed well generally for all sorts of metrics. For example, the green block, you could see it's first in AUC, first in Spearman rank correlation, second in mean square deviation, and fourth in accuracy. Um, brown is a common color, um, so that performed well in RMSD and accuracy. And then you see purple also performing well in AUC, Spearman rank correlation, etc. So um, methods that performed well tended to perform well despite any of the metrics, which is a good sign that you know the metrics kind of agree. I'm also showing the maximum performance values and the median performance values. So the maximum is, uh, maximum is what the best algorithm performed, and that's good because it shows what you know we hope to attain or what we're attaining right now, and the median is on average. Okay, so, you know, does it matter whether you structure or sequence or both? The top two algorithms use structure, sequence, and annotation. Annotation coming from the Swiss Pro database, for example. Um, and then the third one, just use sequence only, but then the fourth and fifth one use structure only. So um, there's no, you know, clear winner here, um, but it's, it, sh it shows that using, using both structure, sequence, and annotation does uh, improve prediction. You can see that there are algorithms in the middle here where they use structure and sequence both, but they didn't, you know, there's also a sequence only that performed better and a structure only that per uh, performed better. So, you know, just because you use both doesn't mean you're going to um, necessarily perform well. It, it depends on the algorithm, obviously. Okay, so the caveats here is CBS is one protein. This is n equals one, and the um, performance values that I showed you uh, probably can't be extrapolated on a genome-wide level because it's only one protein. We had the structure for it; that was nice. Um, and most algorithms did use the structure, which we may not have for most uh, proteins in the human genome. Um, also, um, so also um, the substitutions were picked by the Jasper Ryan group to be preferentially in the structure, so they um, didn't really choose substitutions that were outside of structure, so it's not known what performance would be if we did not have structure. Okay, so these are examples of nice predictions. I'm going to sh tell you how to read these graphs, and then I'm going to show you more graphs like these so you'll know how to read them. Um, on the left-hand side is a uh, valine to alanine substitution at position 356, and the experimental data is shown in the blue curve. So the experimental data showed that it had 100% activity, and you can see the standard deviation here. The black dots represent the predictions made by the submitters, and you can see most of them are around 100. So this is a very nice uh, example where the predictions match the experimental data because most submitters did predict this amino acid substitution to be functionally neutral. Um, this on the right-hand side is a graph of a deleterious substitution from leucine to proline at position 154, and this substitution, when there is no blue graph, means it had zero activity. And you can see that most submitters present, uh, predicted that there was zero activity, which is great. So this is, these are, oops, sorry, these are examples where the predictions match the experimental data very well. Okay, so then we wanted to know, are there some substitutions that are harder to predict that none of the algorithms are getting right, and can we learn from these? So we looked at the substitutions that most algorithms get wrong, and these are areas of improvement for everyone in the field. The first condition, we looked at false positives, where it seemed to be experimentally neutral, but the algorithms predicted this substitution to be damaging. So if you look at this graph here, in blue, is the um, is experimental conditions, and it shows that it, it is uh, functionally neutral and it has 100% activity. But all of the algorithms are here on the left, and they're predicting this substitution to be deleterious. So what's happening here is that what's plotted in blue is high paradoxing conditions. When you have a lot of that uh, PLP cofactor, I'm sorry. Whoa. Okay, sorry. Um, when you have a lot of this uh, PLP cofactor. Um, what's in purple is when you have low paradoxine, when you don't have a lot of that PLP cofactor. So now when you look at the structure of, um, and you, you look at where V118G is, position 118 is right next to position 119, lysine 119. And lysine 119 binds PLP. 
So it makes sense that in high paradoxine conditions, you know, there's enough that lysine 119 is able to bind PLP and there's no problem. But in low paradoxine conditions, um, you're really struggling to bind that and you need the surrounding structure in order to bind PLP. And that's when the next nearby residue of valine 118 is critical. So um, what this suggests is that um, in low paradoxing conditions, predictions would be correct, and you have to look at the right, con uh, right conditions in order to, correct, uh, in order to uh, correctly predict it. Okay, this is another example where there was a lot of false positives, where it was shown to be experimentally neutral, but um, the algorithm is predicted to be damaging. And um, maybe you, I don't know if you're able to see it, but there's these green residues. We map these green residues, and this is leucine 338 and valine 354, and they were kind of near each other on different alpha helices, but near each other. And this region is proposed to interact with the regulatory domain, which was not tested in the yeast complementation assay. So in order to test the regulatory domain, you have to test it with ADOMET, which wasn't tested in this, which means you've got to, um, you know, again, test the right conditions. And in this case, we weren't testing the regulatory domain. Okay, here's another example of false positives where uh, it was experimentally neutral in the CBS assay, but again, the algorithm is predicted to be damaging. And what you can see is actually when we looked at it, um, they weren't experimentally neutral. They were shifted to the right. They increased activity. So um, this substitution valine to alanine at 371, it is shifted to the right, and you have an activity about um, 115. And this substitution also has an increased activity. So um, these aren't neutral substitutions. These actually do change the function of the protein. They increase the activity. Okay, so methods are missing activating mutations. Either these are two examples of activating mutations. You can see their curves are shifted to the right of 100, which I've depicted in orange. And you can see that, like for this one, most of the algorithms predicted to be 100% you know, so it would be functionally neutral, predicted to be functionally neutral, yet it increases activity. And it's the same with this one. Um, in this case, it is also an increased activity, but the algorithms are predicting it to be deleterious. So right now, I would say that the field is not doing a very good job with activating mutations, and it's really a coin toss, and we should do a better job for this. So how many activating mutations were there? It's about 20% of the substitutions assayed were activating, um, and it depends on the con condition. And the reason why we should concentrate on activation muta activating mutations is they're drug targets, and you can imagine that they're important for cancer. For example, if you have an oncogene and you have an activating mutation in an oncogene, that's just as important as a knockout in a tumor suppressor. So there were five programs did, that did pr predict activating mutations that you know, went over 100% activity. And thank you. Um, and it'd be good to see in the future if um, we could improve overall um, this, this field. OK, so now I'm going to go to the next data set, um, which is the Check2 data set. And I talked about the CBS mutations, which is in the yeast. And you know, for translational medicine, People aren't so interested in what's in yeast, they want to know what's the clinical threshold. So for example, in CBS, there's a D444N mutation, which has a lot of activity in E. coli. It has 76% activity in E. coli. But if you were to find it in a patient, um, patients have mild homocystinuria. So how do you translate your enzymatic yeast assay into something clinical? And that is the second data set generated by Sean Tatigian. Um, who looked at check 2 mutations that increased the risk of breast cancer. So what this is doing is it's testing the predictions for clinical and genetics, and he sequenced check 2 in a, uh, over 1,000 breast cancer cases and 1,000 controls. This is the results that um, he generated, and this is very familiar to gen geneticists, um, where you have uh, cases and controls, and odds ratio of one means that you know, it doesn't increase the risk for cancer. Any truncating variant, 17 were found in cases, three were found in controls, and therefore the odds ratio, that means um, basically your increased risk for getting breast cancer if you have a truncating variant is sixfold. And any rare missense variant is 2.2-fold. And obviously um, these amino acid prediction 
uh, algorithms um, subclassify missense, so you could break it down to each missense variant. Um, also, I should mention that Sean uh, wrote a line GVGD, but he did not submit. He kind of did it as a comparison, so he's, he withdrew from uh, the competition as an assessor. Okay, so this is the data set for check two. Um, he, by sequencing the individuals, you get a lot more information. You get the nucleotide change, the amino acid change, the, the number uh, it appeared in cases and the number it appeared in controls and the race ethnicity. So for the first line, um, S5L appears in two cases, one control, you might think that perhaps it increases the risk of cancer. Whereas the third line, P85L, it appeared only in one case and three controls, so you might think that it is neutral. So people were asked to submit the odds ratios, predicted odds ratios, and see how they compared with the real data set. This is what um, they were blind to. They were only given the, uh, the amino acid changes in the nucleotides. Okay, because this is real human data and not, you know, experimental in vitro or in vivo yeast data, this is uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, there are 32 single amino acid substitutions. There are two individuals with double substitutions. So how do we start predicting those if we're really moving to um, translational medicine? There are three permanent pre-termination codons and four frame shifts. And very few people predicted on the pre-termination codons and four frame shifts. And they're kind of the easiest to predict, so that's a good way to, <laughs> to perform well. Um, okay, so here are the check two results. He, yeah, he looked at it using linear regression and odds ratio. And um, again, you can see that the algorithms that performed well in one, with one metric, performed well in, with the other metric. So there's light green that's in common with both, dark green that's in common with both, yellow that's in common with both. Um, and the values are on the right. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are different submitters for check two and CBS, and it'd be nice if um, we could have the same submitters, I think, you know, to translate. The, the functional activity to actually odds ratios. But there was one program that did well in both Check2 and um, CBS, um, but very few submitted to both, so it's hard to, hard to say. Okay, so um, this is an example of, uh, on the top is a table of substitutions that everyone agreed was relatively pathogenic, that it was um, enriched in cases compared to controls, and that is what the true data revealed. Um, for this, there was less concordance of whether it was pathogenic, and the problem is it was only found in one case and zero controls, and so it's hard to know what the true answer is with humans because you can't know it unless you actually sequence more individuals um, to, to find whether or not this is a, a true risk variant or if it's just um, if it's a true risk variant or if it's just a issue uh, with sequencing not sequencing deep enough. Okay, so we had two data sets. Um, the first one was enzyme activity with CBS. And the good thing about this one is, um, you know, it's a very controlled way to measure it, but we can only, um, we only measure what we assay for. So in this case, it was low pyridoxine, high pyridoxine, didn't really test the regulatory region. Um, for odds ratio, for check two, what's good about this is, um, well, unfortunately, you know, if there's not enough people sequenced, you can, or just by statistics, you could get the wrong answer by chance. Now, um, if you want grant money, you know, for translational medicine and saying it's clinical, then calculating odds ratio is much better because there's that translational aspect. Um, with CBS, the meaning is unclear and um, you don't have the human context. Okay, so the future challenges for KG are that the algorithms are missing activating mutations, frame shifts, and truncating mutations. And um, in the future, we hope that submitters will um, submit to both if they can. And we also noticed some algorithms didn't perform well, but we believe it's due to formatting issues. So we are, we're planning on automating submission, and if we see something that's um, wrong right away. We'll, we'll probably just email you right away before we release the data so that we, you could resubmit just in case it's a formatting issue. Okay, um, uh, these are the organizers, assessors, and of course the data sets which are so important. Um, Jasper Ryan's lab um, generating the CBS data set and Sean Tavtigian generating the Check2 data set. Thank you.